I'm super excited and honored to be able to present um, here together with Dakota. And the topic we're going to talk about today is powering the MuleSoft, uh, a Salesforce company modern data analytics framework. Okay, to, to start it up, uh, let me introduce myself first. My name is Christy Tao, and I'm a data platform engineer working at a Salesforce. Uh, I've been with Salesforce uh, and the MuleSoft data platform team for over two years now. And I'm super excited, um, I'm super interested at uh, data innovations and using the most trending data tools to customize uh, a creati creative data solutions to help with the business. And we started our DPD projects with PH Data last year. Um, and uh, Dakota Kelly from PH Data has been a super amazing partner with us. Um, and he gave us so many good ideas and helps us with uh, the design and the implementation. Uh, Dakota, would you like to give an yeah. introduction of yourself? Oh, that's wonderful. I'm Dakota Kelly. I'm a solution architect at PH Data. A lot of software engineering background, so I came and made sure that we focused on the ops side architecture and made sure that we laid out the best foundations to set up the DET project and this integration with best practices in mind. Thank you so much, Dakota. Um, so here's today's agenda. Uh, I will first talk about, um, I will first make an introduction of what's MuleSoft Modern Data Annex Framework, uh, and then I will talk about our challenges, what challenges do we face uh, at the data transformation layer in particular, uh, and then Dakota will uh, talk about how did we integrate DBT with the framework, and he will be sharing some technical details, uh, and we also will cover what are the key benefits from this implementation, and then I will summarize with some key takeaways from our journey. So uh, talking a little bit about history first, our team started around three years, four years ago. Um, and at that time, there was only one central data team. Um, and each domain team was uh, relying on us to get the data they need from a single uh, data warehouse. By domain team, I meant the sales team, uh, finance team, product team. Um, and as time goes, we found this central data team structure brought some challenges and issues to us. And the top one of that is we found ourselves are easy to become the bottlenecks for the other teams uh, and the data projects. Um, it is because we, because we are not the experts in the business areas. Um, compared with the uh, domain teams, uh, we have limited domain knowledge to uh, translate the business logic to the trans transformation logic and produce the data correctly. And sometimes we don't even have the access to the data, especially for the sales data or the finance data. We may, uh, it may take us a few weeks to go through all the approvals um, to get access to data and pull the data into the, our data lake. So all these factors together can lead to the delay of the delivery of the data products and, um, and the solutions. Besides that, every team were doing things so differently. The tools are all, of the, all over the place. Um, there were no agreement on what tools or uh, what standards teams are going to use, for example, for the data consumption, and there were no alignment on the data produced. So it's kind of a challenge for people to collaborate together and work together. So from that point, we started our discussion to move away from a centralized data team to a decentralized data team structure. Um, because we don't want to be the bottlenecks anymore. Uh, with that being said, uh, what we want to build and we were trying to build is a reusable and a self-service data platform that it can easily be shipped over to uh, the domain team so that they can use our capabilities and the functionalities easily and they can focus more on producing uh, the data products and they will be the owner of the data products. Uh, at the same time, our data platform team will focus more on adding the innovations, adding the new features and the functionalities uh, into our framework. So what's uh, all the uh, capabilities and the functionality the self platform uh, has. So firstly, it's an EOT framework. It has the ingestion layer and the transformation layer. Uh, on top of that, we provide our stakeholders with the data quality and catalog fr framework so that uh, they can use that uh, to do, uh, you know, um, 
uh, they can use that to uh, have the get notification for the alerting uh, through Slack or email uh, for like, for example, missing data snapshot or data quality. Uh, and for the data catalog and lineage, we'll provide them with relations so they can use that for the data set discovery. And for the multi-region aggregation framework, we provide uh, our stakeholders with options to do the data aggregation and analysis within different regions. Um, for data products, we uh, set up our standards so the, um, the domain team can use our control tables to do the configuration and to produce the data according to the Kimball dimensional data modeling philosophy. For the data uh, observability, uh, it not only contains the data quality, but also uh, has uh, data security insights and also the data uh, adoption. For the security framework, we also give them the options to configure uh, RBAC policies and also masking policies so uh, we can ensure that the data is secured in our data warehouse. Uh, there are two bubbles, um, matrix layer framework and a streaming framework highlighted in orange because they are still in our roadmap. As mentioned before, this is a reusable framework for implementing a data platform. Uh, we are responsible to maintain all this framework and also do the enablement session to make sure um, all the domain team can use this uh, products easily and that they can focus more on applying their business logic uh, and producing data. And they will produce the reliable data faster and operate uh, uh, more efficiently. Um, as transformation layer is a very critical component for our platform, um, we want to make it as powerful as possible and we want, we want to make sure uh, it's easy to use and it's user friendly. Uh, there were some challenges we were facing to achieve that. Uh, the first challenge was um, it was uh, difficult to collaborate to work on the same data model, especially there was a very compl uh, complicated one. So if it requires multiple engineers working on the same thing, um, it, it was hard to review the other's code because the changes was at the component level uh, with our previous transformation tool that we were using. And it's hard to resolve the merge conflict. And the second challenges we were facing um, is the lack of data lineage. We were not able to track where's the data coming from. And there were a lot of times that I got a message from our stakeholders uh, asking me, where's the data coming from for this particular data warehouse column? And I have to stop my work and go to the, uh, log into the instance and check the SQL manually and get back, them, uh, get back to them later. So this is definitely inefficient for the data governance. And lastly is it was inefficient to produce data. Uh, our team follows the two week spring cycle uh, that means that uh, when, even though I, sometimes I can finish my data model early, but uh, some teammates may work on the security framework and some may work on the ingestion layer, I have to wait the other teams to finish their work together um, and to merge all the changes, release to QA and release to the production. So uh, this means our stakeholders need to wait two weeks until they can get the data they need. Uh, so to address all of these challenges, we decided to bring DBT into our framework. Uh, this is a high level architecture that can give you a good idea of what is our process look like. So looking at all uh, the data sources first, we, our, uh, our ingestion layer has provided um, the domain team a large variety of data connectors that has the ability to pull from uh, a large number of data sources uh, for Salesforce, for example, and Snowflake, and also uh, some traditional relationship database or S3 bucket, uh, REST API, uh, for example, New Relic. Um, and we can add more data connectors options uh, uh, when there's uh, business requirements. And for the business processing, we use Matillion for our uh, in ingestion tool. And on top of that, we have our customized Python library to help us with uh, you know, all the automation, uh, multi-processing, and auditing. And we started to use DBT as our transformation layer. For data storage, uh, we use Snowflake as our primary data warehouse. But in the same time, uh, some tenants, some data domain team are using Amazon Redshift as their data warehouse. And we can also deploy our framework into the Redshift as well. 
For the data exploration and visualization, uh, data analysts usually use Tableau for their reporting. Um, data scientists use Jupyter Notebook for the machine learning models. Um, and we use Alation um, for as our data exploration, data catalog, data, go data governance, and we use Streamlit as well for the data governance. And then I will hand it over to Dakota uh, so that he can talk more about the technical details. Yeah. Of so with us handling ingestion with Matillion, a lot of the processes that were built within this team was to couple transformation with ingestion. As soon as new data landed, we wanted to bring in those transformations and run the new sets of transformations, bring that data, have it as fresh immediately or as close to immediate as that data source was going on. The way we solved this was by building a Python connector that allowed teams as they would bring in new sources in through Matillion, they had a component that could call DBT Cloud. Remember, these are business users. They need the cloud IDE. That's what they're gonna be used to working within. So we wanted to make sure that when they're working within Matillion to pick that new data source that needs to come in, it can connect to DBT Cloud. We wrote Python, it would call REST API, sit there and pull and make sure that everything was running correctly and return back within Matillion so that way all of the already built in logging and metrics of what Matillion was doing would report what happened in DBT Cloud. And it would report that effectively within the same standards we already had in place around Matillion. On top of that, what we started to do was look at, okay, what are the standards we want to see? What are the naming conventions we want people to follow? How do we want these things to look? And we started building in processes to enforce those standards and naming conventions. This meant doing things like providing standard macros that everyone used that would define how to generate database names, how to generate schema names, how to generate aliases, overriding what DBT standard functionality is to enforce those to stick within the expected naming conventions that we had for the entire organization. We would take those things, build out all of these different environments and uh, CI, CD, all of this, package it up into a large package that would go into everyone's repository and it would feed based off of that information. So that way, any team, as soon as we needed to onboard them, they already had all the functionality built in that we were building as the core data team. So one of the things we started to do is we were looking at all of these best practices. There was a set of standard transformations you heard Christy allude to earlier around how they wanted to transform data in a Kimball style model. A lot of the team was used to providing just configs. Here's my cleaned data source, I want you to turn this into a fact. I want you to turn this into a dimension. And they had this control table that would decide what that looked like. Our solution to addressing this was building a custom materialization that would look through those control tables, find all of those tables, determine the type of table, and generate the SQL, and generate those tables for them. Bringing that automation still into DBT, so you still get the full lineage of the table from a clean resource, up to that transformation to be ready as a data warehouse dim in fact, all the way up to snapshots for historical context. But we wanted that automation in DBT and we accomplished that by building a custom materialization that looked at those control tables and automatically generated all the SQL for that middle layer that we already had automation for. And then on top of that, we brought those CI CD best practices. CI CD was hard within Matillion and the way that the transformations were working before. What we were able to do was implement CI CD best practices within AWS code pipelines, where when people would finish with their code, they would open up a pull request, we would run, do all of our tests, get data quality, ship those things off, make sure that the code was going to work in a test environment, merge the pull request, push that code into production, now your model's there, allowing us to really focus on increasing the velocity of the team so they could deliver these products and these transformations significantly quicker than what they were before. Oftentimes they would spend that two week sprint building the entire product and then the next two week sprint was just trying to get it into production, which took a lot of time. We focused on trying to make this as automated as possible so the team didn't need to do anything. And with DBT you get those good best practices. A merge conflict is not the end of the world anymore. It's no longer super difficult to untangle those things. Thank you so much, Lakota. Um, so 
from my personal experience with work, uh, working with the BTI, I can find there it's super powerful and there are a couple of key benefits um, from this implementation. And I can fi finally work on the data as a software engineer and it's so easy to develop with SQL select statement. And from my uh, enablement session with the other domain teams, then they also find it super uh, easy to get onboarded and start to use DBT right away. And the second benefit is the version control. Um, I, as I mentioned before, if we are working on a very complicated data models, uh, I can finally work with someone else. Um, and I, it, it's su super easy to uh, create a PR and to re review the other's code and resolve the merge conflicts get together. Um, and next one is the CICD. Um, as um, introduced by Dakota, and we implement a CICD and it will, uh, greatly improve our delivery of the data products. Previously we have two weeks and now we can only deliver the data products within only two days if, whenever, uh, whenever the data is ready to go. And last one is automatic data lineage graph. Um, I don't need to manually maintain the data mappings anymore within our database. And um, the data lineage is auto automatically pop up within DBT. Uh, and we can also like sync the information to our data catalog, catalog tooling so that uh, our stakeholders can use that as a reference. So all these key benefits are driven into our um, improved improved performance and looking at the numbers here, there, there is a 70% improved runtime efficiency per EOT round. Uh, this is because uh, DBT has a built-in feature to figure out what is an upstream and a downstream, and it will run the pipeline with the most optimized way. Um, and then we can deliver the data products within two days, and then the uh, developer productivity was increased by 100% because uh, we can work on the same data model together. Uh, to summarize, so if you are in a similar position as we are, or you are already using DBT or thinking about using DBT, here are some key takeaways that um, we want to share so that you can maximize the benefits of DBT in your data pipeline. Um, the first one is you can integrate DBT with the other tools to streamline your data pipeline. Uh, in our case, we uh, do the integration with DBT, um, between DBT and Matillion. And if you are using the other tools in, inside of your organization, you can, um, you can do that pretty easily. Uh, and the second one is leverage advanced micros. We found this is super powerful because we convert uh, some part of our Python library into the micros uh, and it can, you can do your customized solution by using the micros and it can be shared across the teams. The third one is you can take advantage of the DBT data governance features, especially the lineage. Um, as I mentioned before, you can do the integration between DBT and Alation as well and you can sync and push the information to uh, to Alation and you can use that as a single source of truth. Um, that's all the contents we want to cover today. I think we have some time for the Q&A. Yeah. Um, for the DBT clone <coughs> macros that you use, could you expand like why were you using cloning um, in there? Like what was the use case with, yeah. with the DBT cloud CI/CD? Yeah, so what we did was we took some macros that would run on pre-run around CI CD, and what that cloning was doing was making sure our test environment had the most up-to-date everything that our production had, so that way when it ran, we knew that what was running in test really looked like what it was gonna run in production, so if we would get a failure, that would happen. What that macro looked like was you would supply, here's all the stuff that I know my, my uh, project uses. It was a simple config added as a pre-hook that would run at the beginning. And what it would do is on CI CD, when I'm running when I, into a test environment, I'm gonna clone all of production down into my test environment. So I know my test is fully up to date with what everything looks like in production, my source data, my everything. And then I'm gonna run so that way I know if there's some new piece of data that might break, I've got that and I'm gonna catch that in my test environment instead of finding out in production when I've broken a dashboard. That was what a lot of that cloning was, was we built that in just using some, um, we had a very strong uh, stored procedure that we were able to make use of that had recognition of the different environments and we could essentially just supply, here's some configs, here's what this project cares about, clone it into our test environment. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate more on how CI CD helped you like, increase your... 
Yeah. Before, it was a very manual CI CD process. We weren't able to really make use of Git flows, proper pull requests, and stuff like that. What we did was we automated everything. So that way, the only thing, the only piece of human interaction is I finished my code, I'm going to create a PR, and I'm going to have proper uh, approval processes. Someone has to go in and approve. Everything else was automated. AWS Code Pipeline would recognize a PR has been opened. I'm going to go run and test. And I'm going to let you know if test ran successfully or not. Because if test didn't run successfully, I should not be merging the PR. I should wait until test runs successfully. It will do that. And then someone can go in and approve. Once it's approved, everything gets merged into production and it runs the new code in production. That was the automation we got instead of having to have a manual process of people trying to move things around and get them into the right place. So the, the PR review efficiently, like yeah. the code the testing already happened. Yeah, yeah, it becomes part of that workflow. So all the approver has to do is wait and see, did everything run successfully? If it did run successfully, okay, now I can do a quick code review, make sure the changes make sense, stuff like that. Because why would you even spend time code reviewing if the code doesn't run anyways? You wanna make sure it runs first, and then let's code review, make sure it's up to standard. I believe you had one. Yeah, you guys had mentioned you guys had a challenge with people working on the same model, um, that it was merge conflicts. Uh, so if you have two different developers who are working on different features and they touch the same model, how did you guys uh, approach that? So we were able to make use of a lot of the Git best practices. So what we did was we focused on teaching people what does a merge conflict look like within Git and how to collaborate with teams so we could push that back onto the team to let them know, okay, here's this merge conflict, here's where the problem is. Maybe it's two people working on the model, and what happened is one person just committed before the other, and both features need to get in there. That's easy. You just remove your hash and let both new columns come in, as an example. Maybe there's a bit more. Maybe someone else is fixing a bug. What, we, what this allows us to do is they could see who the person was. They could collaborate and find out what's going on. Was that a bug fix that I need to make sure is in my code as well? Are you also just adding new features that I just, we just need to make sure both features get in? We're able to enable the developers to do this instead of it being stuck in an ops team who has to figure it out for themselves. Developers could address this, get this done, making the ops team's job easier. So is there, is there a way you, you allow them to visualize where the merge conflicts are and what, what they can do about it? Yeah, so with Git, it automatically marks where the merge conflict is. We were just spent time enabling people to understand what Git was doing, what that was telling them, and how to address it. Yeah. Can you elaborate further on the control table and maybe provide any examples? Yeah, so the control table, think of it essentially like a, a deep table of, okay, here's this data source. I want this to become a fact table. Here's how I want it to be named. Here's a list of like some of the columns, some of the calculations okay. I, I expect to do. It's really just a list of configs of what I want a table to become okay. and where I want that data to come from. Yeah, so there's a lot of features built into DBT to help with that governance. So one thing is that you get kind of the starting of a catalog. If you've not ever built a catalog for your organization, the DBT docs act as a good starting catalog. But if you have a cataloging tool like Alicia and Atlan, name your cataloging tool, most of them will integrate and extract that data out of DBT meaning the documentation, the best practices, the lineage, all that stuff, that's not wasted effort on your development team. That becomes a part of your greater cataloging of all your data assets. That was a lot of what we were putting in place was setting those features up, as well as starting to lay the foundations for what would become the governance features that have been announced this week, starting to look at some of those, laying the foundations for data mesh and other activities. Meta testing is extremely important, and that's one of the nice things about something like the project evaluator, is it's gonna look at what's happened after the macro has run. So that allows us to double check that people are following best practices. Meta testing is extremely important, because I'm sure we've all been there before. You start out your first set of project, it looks great. You open it up to a bunch of people, and then it turns into the spaghetti code, and it makes it difficult to maintain. Something like the project evaluator and other meta testing allows you to build in testing to your whole project architecture and go, 
okay, that's our best practices. You need to follow those, because those are gonna fail. And if it's failing on PR because of architecture, maybe the code runs fine, but there's architectural problems, that means I'm not merging your PR. You need to go stick to our best practices as an organization to make sure that we have clean, efficient DAGs that can run in no time. So we had two processes. One was to return a message of success or failure just to the PR. What we also did was we took full advantage of DBT artifacts, tracking everything that happened within our DBT project, as well as dumping manifest into this large table. We had a data quality framework. What we would do is this data quality framework would look at large volumes of things that happened, tests that run, what happened. We were dumping all this data into one place that a Tableau dashboard could look at it to give us a historical view. So then what we could do is come in and go, hey, we're starting to see certain models are taking longer, or you know, a certain developer is putting a lot of bugs into code. We need to figure out what's going on. How do we help fix this and keep this from becoming an issue, et cetera? So we tracked all of those artifacts and that metadata, so that way we could do both, essentially. Yeah. So that first question, why don't you meet us back at the booth? We can sure. talk, catch you up with that. I don't want to bore everyone else here. The second question, what DBT does is it gives you all the orchestration. It gives you all the bits to make advantage of that CI CD. All we had to do was pick how we wanted it to run. What thing do we want to monitor for pull requests? For us, that was AWS code pipeline. For you, it might be GitLab, might be GitHub, could be Bit, you know, Bitbucket. You pick your tool. You pick that, you monitor for pull requests. And all we were doing was sending off calls to the DBT Cloud API to tell it what to run. We could use this to configure SlimCI. I don't know if you've taken a look at SlimCI. If you haven't, you should. You can make use of it to optimize your CI CD deployments. As your project gets huge, you can use this to make sure you're only running code that's changed, because why would you rerun your entire pipeline if only you know, a tenth of it has changed? That's wasted compute on a modern data warehouse. You can use it to do stuff like that. You can get smart reruns. You can look for, okay, the last time this ran, what failed? Should I rerun to see if what's been fixed is actually fixed and start from that point if there was a lot of changes? You get a lot of those features within SlimCI. All we did was take a look at, okay, here's what DBT has. Where are those integrations? And just connect the pieces. That's really all we had to do. There wasn't really inventing, you know, reinventing the wheel. It was just connecting the disparate systems. Separate database, but a lot of very different control structures in place around roles and things like that. So that was the reason for wanting to make use of the clone. This cloning feature would essentially bring everything down and then reset the roles to the correct thing within our test environment. Any other questions? All right, I think uh, that's it for today. Uh, um, Dakota and I will be around uh, in the hallway and in here. So if you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to us and we are happy to answer that. Um, and thank you so much for attending this session I, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you.